In this chapter, I would like to talk about the actions and the loads. On my screen, the Sophie Plus of the example file and the SSD of the example file is open, so I can go back and forth between the two if I want to. It could be necessary because the loads and the actions can be defined in Sophie Plus on the Loads tab in the Load Case Manager. But from version 2020, it's also possible to define the actions in the Action Manager in SSD. For example, if I open up the Action Manager, you will find the Action tabs uh, within it and you will find the already predefined actions. Based upon the chosen code that we together had chosen at the beginning in the, at the System Information dialog box, the software will try to figure out what actions you will need in this example file. Of course, you need to overview these actions and decide one by one whether or not you will need it or, or you will need them or not. Now I will click on the cancel button here and go back to Sophie Plus and I would like to show you that the same window or the same dialog box can be achieved if you click on the load case manager on the loads tab in Sophie Plus. The difference can be seen here that in Sophie Plus we can also assign and create the load cases and not just the actions. The same actions can be found here like in SSD, but we can also create new load case if we want to. Now let's go back to the actions and think over what type of actions we are going to need for this particular example file. To illustrate the actions that we are going to need in this example file, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint slides and First and foremost, we are going to talk about the permanent actions. So we are going to create or we must have an action for the dead load. Uh, action called G underscore one stands for that. For the additional dead load on the structure, such as the surface load or the surfacing, will be assigned to action underscore G2. The actions from the pre-stressing will be assigned to action P and the actions from the creep and shrinkage effects will be assigned to action C. These actions are very, very important for, uh, for us. These actions are called permanent actions and please try to remember the first letter of these, these actions because later on we are going to refer to these letters like GPC actions. G, P, and C actions. The other type of actions that we need to consider in our example file are as follows. We need to set up an action for the temperature loading and assign the temperature loads to action T. One action for the wind effect, including the traffic, and one action for the wind effect without the traffic. For example, during the construction stages, or during the construction of the structure, there could be a case where wind is applied to the structure, but there is no traffic on the structure yet. We need to think and create an action for the settlement loadings, or I should say the effects from the settlement. Finally, we need to set up actions for the traffic load. And the reason why I'm saying actions is because we are going to collect the effects into an action from the tandem loads of the traffic load into another action we are going to assign the effects from the UDL load of the traffic loading and we also need to consider the horizontal loading on our structure coming from the traffic loads. So now if we go back to Sophie Plus we can see that these actions are already defined, so we can find the action C for creep and shrinkage uh, effects, action G underscore 1 for the dead load, action G underscore 2 for the additional dead load, action GR underscore T for the tandem load of the traffic loads, and action 
uh, gr underscore u for, for the UDL part of the traffic loads. And finally, action p, effects from the pre-stressing. We can add new actions uh, to the already defined actions if we click on the new button in this dialog box. And either we choose from the predefined actions or we can create a user defined action on our own. Now let's try to find the actions that I mentioned on the slides in the drop down list and add it to the model. So I can see the temperature loading action T is available. So I will select it from the drop down list and click on the OK. And now it has been added to the action list. Similarly, let's try to find the other actions based upon the slide that I showed you. Wind, additional wind including traffic. And the other one was the wind in construction stages when we do not have the traffic on our model. Let's try to find a settlement type of action. Yes, it is here, marked with F. I will click OK and add it to the actions and it appeared in the action list. And now let's try to add uh, the live loading. So basically you have two uh, options. One of them is L for live loading and the second one is GR live loading. Please select the GR live loading. Because if you select the action GR, then you will have the possibility to choose the so-called load groups according to table 4.48 from the Eurocode. And you will be able to select action GR underscore 2, GR underscore 3, 4 and 5 to create the full uh, live loading, traffic loading on your bridge as it is necessary according to the Euro code. So now in the new action dialog box, we have chosen already the GR live loading and from the category, because an action can have categories as well, we can select uh, category two, which is for the horizontal forces. And now if I click on the OK button, you will find the action GR underscore two has been added the action list. Now we are going to review the actions one by one according to the actions name, descriptions and partition. At the moment the actions are grouped or presented in, a, in an ascending order according to the actions name. We can present them according to the description and by the way with a double click I can change the description of an action or we can also present it according to the partition. Now I would like to talk a little bit about this partition. Actually, what is a partition of an action is? To understand it better, I'm going to refer to the description of Eurocode in the next slide. On the screen, you can see three combination rules. For example, the topmost one is presenting the ULS combination rule. In this formulae, we can see action types, or actually the action partitions, action G, action P, action Q. We can also find the so-called safety factor in this formulae, and also the so-called combination factor. And the way how you need to read this formulae is the following. To get uh, the most severe effect on your structure, you need to uh, sum all the effects from the action G and then add or subtract all the effect from the pre-stressing multiplied with the safety factor. And then again, you need to add or subtract the effects from the leading action multiplied with its safety factor plus V or uh, minus, we need to add the summation of the other uh, action cues multiplied with its safety factor and multiplied with their combination factors. 
and as you can see this formula also, also uses the partition action G P Q in other prescribed combination rules we might find other partitions of the actions for example the middle combination rule presents the accidental combination rule here you will see an extra or a new partition which is the accidental one the very last combination rule present the seismic or earthquake combination rule and here you can see another uh, partition namely the earthquake partition so in our software in sophistic basically we have these main five partition uh, action g action p action q action a for the accidental and action e for the earthquake partition if we go back to sophi plus you can also follow along these uh, partitions action g is for permanent action p is for the pre-stress action q is for the variable actions partition and action e is for the accidental one action e is for earthquake now let's make a quick overview about the actions and the partitions whether or not they are corresponding to each other properly so the dead load and the additional dead load are assigned to partition G, which is correct. The action pre P, pre-stressing and action C, uh, creep and shrinkage effects are assigned to uh, partition P, which is fine. The additional wind, the settlement, the temperature load and the wind in the construction stages are all variable actions and hence they are in partition Q, which is also fine. And the last three actions, gr underscore t underscore u underscore 2, are assigned to new type of partitions, namely q underscore 1 and q underscore 2. The underscore and the number notation means a subcategory for an action. So in this case, the q underscore 1 and q underscore 2 are actions with a subcategory for the variable action Q. If we look at one more time the ULS combination rule, you can find a leading action in it with its safety factor. However, you also need to act or subtract the summation of the effects from the concomitant actions multiplied with its combination factor and the safety factor. This means that, for example, there is one leading action, for example, the wind on the structure, and you need to add the effects from uh, the traffic loading multiplied with the combination factor with this so-called psi null value. These psi null values can be found also within this action table. And as you can see, for example, for the tandem loads of uh, the traffic loads, and the UDL loads of the traffic loads, the Psi null values are different. And this is why I had to separate them into different actions. It's also important to understand that the effects from the tandem and the UDL loads assigned to action Q1 can work together with the other variable actions, for example, the settlement, the temperature and the wind loads but they cannot act together with the other category Q underscore 2. And this is exactly what we want to achieve. The tandem and the UDL loads are assigned to action GR underscore 1 and they are independently acting, for example, from the horizontal forces that are assigned to uh, action GR underscore 2. So once more, a subcategory means that the actions Q underscore 1 can work together with action variable Q. Also, the other subcategory Q underscore 2 can work together with the variable action Q. But Q1 and Q2 cannot work together with each other. The next property of the action I would like to elaborate 
is the so-called superposition type. You can see there are many types of superpositioning, such as permanent, or exclusive, or conditional, or extended exclusive within an action, and so on and so forth. So what does exactly this superposition type mean? I can best explain on this example, which was created for the superposition kind. The example is the following. I have a two-span girder, and I would like to assess the maximum MY bending moment from different type of load cases, from different type of actions, actually. If I want to explain the super superposition type perm, then you need to imagine two load cases. In load case 102, there is a UDL load assigned to load case 102. Both load cases, load case 101 and 102, are assigned to action G1, for example, and the superposition type for this action is set to perm. In this case, to get the maximum MY bending moment in this cross section, the software will take load case 101 and 102, add the effects of these two from these two load cases, and multiply with the gum U, which stands for gamma unfavorable. So even though load case 102 makes a favorable effect on the maximum MY bending moment, because we assigned this load case 102 to the permanent action as well, it is going to be considered with a factor of 1.35, which is the unfavorable safety factor. Now try to imagine the next case, which is set for the superposition type perk. Let's imagine that load case 201 is acting on the first pen with a value of 10 kN per meter. And this load case 201 is assigned to action G2, which is a permanent load case, permanent action, sorry. And the superposition type of this action is set to perk. Similarly, load case 202 is a 10 kN per meter UDL load on the second span, span. And load case 202 is assigned to also action G2 with the superposition type perk. In this case, load case 201 acts unfavorable and therefore it is going to be multiplied with 1.35, whereas load case 202 acts favorable and therefore it is multiplied only with 1.0. So if the superposition type set to perk within the action, then the software will know which load case gives favorable or unfavorable effects and then it's going to use the corresponding unfavorable safety factor or the favorable safety factor. Okay now let's see the next case. Let's try to imagine that load case 301 is 10 kN per meter UDL load on the first span and load case 301 is assigned to action Q3 which superposition type is set to conditional. And on the second span, we assigned or we created load case 302, which is assigned to the same action Q3 with the superposition type cond. So in this case, the conditional superposition type means that both load cases will only take into account if they are unfavorable. In this particular small example, the load case 301 acts unfavorable, so it's going to be considered and multiplied with 1.5. So what is going to happen internally is that the software will take load case 301 and multiply with the unfavorable safety factor of the action. And then it's also going to take load case 302, but multiplied with the favorable safety factor which is a 0, 0.0 in this case. Okay, now let's move on the next superposition type, which is the ANC. This is basically a conditional superposition type, but with unfavorable signs. What does it mean? 
Again, imagine load case 601 as 10 kN per meter UDL load on the first pan, and this load case 601 is assigned to action Q6, which superposition type is set to ANSI. And load case 602 is a 10 kN per meter UDL load on the second span. Also, this load case is assigned to action Q6 with the superposition type ANSI. So as you can see, ANSI is also a conditional type with unfavorable signs. So in this case, the software will take load case 601 and multiply it with the unfavorable factor. The software will also take load case 602 and multiply it with the unfavorable safety factor. But to get the maximum MY bending moment in the cross section, the software will deduct the second value from the first one. So the effects from load case 602 will be considered, but with a negative safety factor being equal with 1.5. Okay, now let's move to the exclusive superposition type. Now we need to imagine different type of loading, namely point loads. Now I ask you to imagine 11 load cases from load case 401, 402, 403 up to load case 411. These are all point loads with a value of 5 kN for example. These load cases from 401 until 411 are assigned to action Q underscore 41 and the superposition type for this action is set to exclusive. Similarly, Try to imagine the load cases from 451, 52, 53 until 461 with a value of 5 kN. These load cases are assigned to action Q4 underscore 2 and the superposition type is also set to exclusive. So load case 401 until 411 are assigned to action Q underscore 1, whereas load cases 451 to 461 are assigned to action Q4 underscore 2. If these actions Q4 underscore 1 and Q4 underscore 2 are set up as exclusive, then the load cases within one category are mutually exclusive but conditional, and therefore the program puts them into two alternative groups group A1 and group A2, for example. And the software will take one of these 11 load case to get the maximum MY bending moment at the cross section and multiplies it with the gamma, gamma unfavorable safety factor. Similarly, the software will take one load case from group A2 and multiplies it with the gamma unfavorable safety factor. So if we come back to this uh, figure or diagram, of course the software will take load case 403 and 453 and multiplies them with 1.5. Please also notice that if it gives the most unfavorable effect, the software can take no load case from the groups. Okay, now let's discuss the extended exclusive superposition type. Again, I'm asking you to imagine 11 load cases. Now they are numbered from 501 to 511. And these 11 load cases are assigned to action Q5 underscore 1. The next 11 load cases are numbered from load case 551 until 561 and these 11 load cases are assigned to action Q5 underscore 2. If the superposition type was set to extended ex exclusive for these actions Q5 underscore 1 and Q5 underscore 2, then it means that the load cases are mutually exclusive within all categories. 
So all the load cases are now in one alternative group. And therefore only the most unfavorable load case will be used either from action Q45 underscore 1 or Q5 underscore 2. And only if it has an unfavorable contribution to the maximum MY bending moment at the cross section. So the differences to the normal exclusive uh, superposition type is that here all the 22 load cases will be assigned to one alternative load case group. So this means that only one load case will be selected and multiplied with the unfavorable gamma value. To understand the next superposition type, which is the extended exclusive with unfavorable sign, you need to imagine again 11 load cases. Also now, try to imagine that instead of the maximum MY bending moment, now we are looking for the minimum MY bending moment at this particular cross section. So again, we have 11 and just 11 load cases with 5 kN point load. The load case numbers are starting from 701 and ending at 711. All of these 11 load cases are assigned now to action Q underscore 7. So if the superposition type is set to USEX, it means exclusive with, it, with unfavorable sign. This means that all load cases act mutually exclusive with changing sign. So if I want to get the minimum MY bending moment in this cross section, then this load case will be selected 703 and multiplied with negative minus 1.5. Okay, and the very last superposition type, it is called exclusive, but always, that's why always exclusive LX. Again, try to imagine 11 load cases starting from 801 till 811. All these 11 load cases are assigned to action Q underscore 8 and the superposition type is set to LX. So the only difference between the exclusive superposition type and the LX superposition type is that previously in the exclusive superposition type the software or the module could take no load cases if it makes the most unfavorable value for the maximum MY bending moment. But if the superposition type is set to LX, then the software or the corresponding module maxima must take one of the load cases from these 11 load cases. In other words, the load cases act mutually exclusive but one of them is always considered for the superpositioning to get the maximum MY bending moment in the cross section. If the superposition type is set to exclusive or extended exclusive, then it is possible that the program will not choose any of the load cases if it's the most unfavorable effect. So at the end of the day, the software will take a load case 803 and multiply it with the unfavorable safety factor, which is 1.5. As now I have explained all the most important superposition types of the actions, let's go back to Sophie Plus to the definition of the actions table. And let's go through and have an overview about the superposition types. So the permanent actions are set to perm, and also the creep and shrinkage effects or the actions for the creep and shrinkage effects are set to the superposition type perm, which is fine. The additional wind including the traffic and the wind acting in the construction phases are set to exclusive. Normally this could be okay when you have uh, many load cases within this action acting from one side and also from the other side. 
but in this particular example file I'm just going to define a load case from one side only and I'm going to choose therefore the exclusive with unfavorable sign for the additional wind with traffic and also for the wind in the construction stages because in this way I don't need to bother uh, with the orientation of the wind loading I'm just simply going to apply the wind loads from one side and the software can decide with which sign it's going to give the most unfavorable effect on the structure okay uh, action F which is uh, set up for the settlements are set to conditional which seems to me correct because these settlements will be uh, defined at the three support locations and they are uh, acting or not acting making the most unfavorable effects so the conditional superposition type is correct in this case okay the next one is the action T for the temperature loading I'm going to set up and combine the temperature load together in this action T so actually uh, more load cases will be set up in this action and therefore the exclusive within the category is correct here too. okay now let's look at the traffic loads and their superposition types the action for the tandem loads are set to exclusive and also the actions for the UDL loads are set to exclusive since we are going to work with the traffic loader task in SSD whose uh, background the module Ella is working and this module is uh, delivering the most unfavorable uh, effects from the tandem load and also from for from the UDL loads of the traffic loads for every single element within our model and therefore the exclusive superposition type is correct because we would like to take only one of these uh, effects one from the tandem and one from the UDL loads however if we were to use the so-called load stepping method where, did we, where we define single load cases and analyze it with the software and then manually superimpose these uh, results then we should choose here the ex extended exclusive superposition type however with the workflow that we are about to use with module ELLA the superposition type exclusive is the proper one also the extended exclusive uh, for the gr underscore 2 action is proper here the only remaining things that we should overview are the safety factors and the combination factors of our actions normally when we set up a new project with the code that we would like to use and use the already predefined actions within this newly created model then the safety factors and the combination factors are assigned properly to one action but one can have a look at it uh, at least at some actions whether or not the factor safety factors and the combination factors are according the standard or according to the code one last thing that I would like to show here is how to create a user defined action because sometimes it could be useful uh, to create our own action to do so you just need to simply click on the new button and instead of the predefined actions we need to choose the user defined action here we can add an action name like for example X and the category A for example and the description test and then we click OK you will see that the action X and the subcategory A was given to the name and between these two 
an underscore was inserted. Therefore, for example, if I create a new user defined action and starting with y, 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 when I enter the third y, the category is grayed out because then y, y, y underscore and a new letter will be more than four characters and it is not possible. So what you can do is maximum add action name as two characters, y, y, and to the category another letter and the description could be uh, longer. And then in this case, the newly created action will be called yy underscore b. For the newly created user defined action, you must enter and fill all the value, I mean the unfavorable safety factor, the favorable safety factor, the accidental safety factor, and the combination factors one by one. It is necessary since it's a manually created action and the software doesn't know by default the safety factors and the combination factors of an action that is outside the given code. Of course, in our example file, we don't need this manually created action, so I will just simply multi-select it with the help of my control button on my keyboard, and I will simply click on the delete button. As now we have created all the actions and overviewed them, I will just simply click on the OK button to accept these definition. We need to set up the load cases within our project as well, which can be also done in the load case manager. So I will simply re-click on the load case manager and now we are going to talk about and discuss the second tab, which is the load case tab. If you click on it, you will see three buttons on the right side. And if you select the new, then a target load case will be offered for you. If the increment load case is automatically checkbox is not selected, then you have the possibility to enter the load case number. Otherwise, if you click on the new button, the new load case number will be increased automatically by one. Now I will simply click on the OK button and load case number one has been inserted. I can enter the title of the load case, for example, self-weight. And I can also assign this load case to any of the previously created uh, actions. Please notice that I have two new actions that I haven't defined previously. The action which is called imp and stands for the imperfections. In the imperfection action, you can set up an action which doesn't contain any loads, only geometric imperfection. And this action cannot work standalone, only with a combination with one action, which really contains static loads. The other type of action that can be selected is the none. If you want a certain load case not to be involved in the superpositioning, then you must select this action type none. This would mean when the automatic superposition is undertaken by the software based upon the code regulations, based upon the combination rules from the chosen code, then this load case will not be a part of this superpositioning. Also, please notice if you select the action type to be equal with none, then the unfavorable safety factor, the favorable safety factor and the combination factors needs to be entered manually, but of course by default it is set to zero because we would like this load case not to be, not to be involved in any superpositioning. Let's set the action type uh, back to action g underscore one to that load. Now I will select the first line of load case and I would like to demonstrate what will happen if I click on the new button to create a new load case. So I will simply click on the new button and I will accept the offered load case number 
2. And now, as you can see, a new load case has been created with the original title of the load case and with the original action of the load case. If I select it now to action uh, G2, for example, select the line and then click on the new button, accept the offered load case, then a copy will be created about the last load case with the same title and the same action type. However, it is very important that only the title and the action names are copied over. The loads within this load case is not copied over. It's a very important difference. If you want to copy a certain load case with the static loads considered in it, then you need to click on the copy button here. If you do so, the software will ask for a target load case number and a factor with which the loads should be taken over. And then when you click OK, this is the way how you can take over not just the title and the action of a previously created load case, but also the loads within that previously generated load case. To delete one or more load cases, you can multi-select using your control button and your mouse, or you can use also the shift button and your mouse to multi-select several lines within this load cases tab, and then you just need to simply click on the delete button. Should all the three load cases really be deleted? You can say yes, and then all the load cases are deleted. One additional thing that I would like to mention here is these factors DLX, DLY, and DLZ. So basically these are factors with which the body force of the structure will be multiplied in the global X, global Y, global Z direction. So the body force of the structure will be calculated automatically as follows. For example, in our example file, we have a beam structure. So the beam structure has a cross section, which means uh, it is possible to calculate the area of this cross section. And we also have the length of the beam elements. From these information, a volume will be calculated in meter on the third power. So this volume then will be multiplied with the density of the used material. Since our structure is made out of concrete, the density of the concrete in kilogram per cubic meter will be multiplied with the volume of the structure. And the product of these two will be self-weight of the structure in kilograms. So we are going to have the mass of our structure. In order to translate it into forces, we may need to multiply it with the gravitational acceleration. And if we want to activate this gravitational acceleration in the global X, in the global Y, or in the global Z direction, we need to apply a factor. Normally, to calculate the self-weight of the structure, we activate it with a factor of 1 in the direction of the global Z direction. But if you want, we can also activate this uh, body force in the direction of the global X or in the global Y. In some cases, for example, when we want to investigate an accidental situation, we consider the self-weight of, of the structure in the global Z direction with a factor of 1, but also apply another factor, for example, 2.5% of the dead weight of the structure in the global Y direction. With the help of these body force factors, it is very easy to create such a load case. OK, as now we went through the handling of this load cases tab and how to create the self-weight of the structure, now we just need to set up the load cases that will be necessary in this example file. For this purpose, I would like to present the load cases that we should create according to the PowerPoint slides. 
So in load case uh, one, we should set up the dead load or the self weight of the structure. In load case two, we would like to consider additional dead load, for example, the self weight of the asphalt layers being equal with 2.5 kN per square meter in total. From the pre-stressing of the tendons, we are going to get curvature loads. These curvature loads will be stored in load case 11. The wind loads on the structure will be considered from load case 31 to 32. The possible settlements for the ULS checks will be set up from load case 51 to load case 53. The other type of settlements uh, for the SLS checks are not going to be considered in this uh, specific model for simplicity. Finally, I will set up uh, individual or single load cases for the temperature change to the constant and to the uniformly changed temperature loads as well. And I'm going to combine them in the load cases from 91 to 98. Okay, so let's set up this load case scenario in the load case manager. So now if we go back to Sophie Plus, we will find the already created self weights with a factor of 1.0 uh, in the global Z direction. This is fine for us, for load case number one. The only change that I'm going to make is to assign this load case number one to action none. The reason why I'm doing this is because later on in the construction manager, the self weight of the activated parts will be automatically considered. This load case is only necessary for me to have a brief overview of the behavior of the structure. So the second load case I would like to create is for the additional dead loads. I will click on the new button and load case two is the number that I would like to choose. The name is going to be additional dead load in brackets ADL and it's also going to be assigned to action none because I'm not going to take into account this in a superpositioning. Uh, basically the module uh, CSM, the construction stage manager, is going to consider this load case in a certain construction stage. Then I'm going to set up a new load case for the curvature loading from the pre-stress. So I will simply click on the new. The target load case number is to be 11. The title is going to be curvature loading. And the action type is going to be none. The next two load cases that I'm going to set up is going to be for the additional wind including traffic and the wind in the construction stages. So I will click on the new button and enter the target load case number to be equal with 31. The title would be wind from left and right, wind from left slash right. The action to assign to this load case is going to be the ZW, which is for the additional wind, including traffic. The next load case I'm going to create is going to be 32. The title could remain the same, only the action needs to be changed to SW, wind in the construction stages. Now I will set up three new load cases for the settlement loadings with the number of uh, 51 first. The title will be Settlement Abutment Beginning and the action type to be assigned to is going to be F for the settlements. Similarly, I'm going to create load case 52. The title I'm going to rewrite at settlement at middle pier. Action is going to be F 
as for settlement and the third load case for the settlements will be uh, 53 and it's going to be settlement abutment at the end of the structure and the action type is F as well. Now I'm going to create four new load cases for the temperature loading. In this load case I'm going to set up a constant temperature change with a positive sign and the reason why I'm set the action type to be equal with none is that I'm going to create new load cases and I would like to make a combination of these load cases and store the results in the action T for temperature. So now I'm just going to set up a new load case with number 82 and only the title needs to be changed. This load case is going to be set up for the constant temperature change with a negative sign. The last two load cases will be set up for the linearly changing temperature load within the cross section. So I will simply click on the new button as well and I'm going to add temperature plus DTZ referring to the temperature change in the local Z direction of the cross section. The action to assign to remains as none and now I'm going to create my last load case which is going to be with load case number 40. 84, sorry, and the name will be temperature minus delta Tz and the action will be none. To better demonstrate what we are going to do, I have made a sketch. So basically we are going to set up first load case 81 and 82 with a constant temperature change. Load case 81 will be a positive constant temperature change, whereas load case uh, 82 will be a negative constant temperature change. Uh, load case 83 will be a temperature change along the local z-axis, in which the uh, bottom fiber is going to be warmer, and in load case 84 the bottom fiber will be colder than the top fiber. In this sketch I am just presenting two possible combinations. But of course in our model I'm going to set up all the possible combinations that can come out using only these four single load cases. Okay, if we are going back to the load case manager in Sophie Plus, I think we defined all the load cases that we are going to need, so I will just simply click on the OK button to accept these settings. Do not forget to save your Sophie Plus drawing with the help of Ctrl S keyboard combination. And now I would like to continue with the definitions and the type of the loadings. Basically we have two main type of loads. What is the difference between the two? Well the element loads are always related to the element. I mean, they are always a reference to the structural elements. The free loads always has their own geometry and they are independent from the structural element. Let me illustrate this with examples and maybe let's start with the element loads. Then I can select a load case for my newly defined loads. If I haven't defined any load case yet, then I have the possibility to do that with this dot 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 button and then I will be directed to the load case manager to create a new load case. But we do not need this because we already defined all the load cases, so I will just simply select load case number one for the definition of these loads. Then you need to select the classification or the art of the load. Then you can also choose the type of the load case. This means in this case the orientation which can be given in the local XYZ directions or in the global XYZ directions. 
or you can keep with the gravity directions uh, which I'm going to do at this time. The value of 10 kN is also fine with me. I will simply click on the OK and you can see that the load with the test description PG stands for the gravity direction and 10 kN is the value of the load and it is applied on the structural point. One important feature to mention is that we can modify an already created load if we go to the right side on the load tab. On the left side we can define the loads and on the right side we can modify them. It is very similar like we saw it for the structural element. So now if I click on the modifying point loads on structural points and simply select a point load and then hit enter, I will be able to edit the load definition I had just created. And this is just one way to edit the already created loading. Because if we go back to the structural elements tab, then we also have the possibility there to edit the structural elements. And now the structural element information will contain the loading information too. So if I select to edit one structural point, select it and hit enter, you will see there is a new tab added to this dialog box, namely the loads tab. And below this loads tab, you will find your already created loading. And of course, here you also have the possibility to add new loads to the structural point. For example, if you click on this plus sign, then a new line will be added where you can also give a new name to the load case. You can assign the loads to another load case. You can also select a new classification for this load and so on and so forth. Here you also have the possibility to delete all the entries with this button. And if you select one line, you have the possibility to clone this load case. If you click on this button, on my other screen appeared the copy with options dialog box. And here I can set a load case offset, for example, 10. The load value offset will be 1 and the load value factor will be 1.0 and now I click OK and I will accept these changes and as you can see a copy or a clone of load case 1 has been created and uh, the load case offset was 10 so that's why my load case to be assigned to will be load case 11 and also uh, the load value offset was set to 1 kN, so the new value will be 11 kN. In this example file, the loads defined in line 2 and 3 are not necessary, so I will multi-select them with the help of control button and my mouse button, and I will simply click on the delete, and now the two lines have been deleted. I will click on the OK to go back to the graphical user interface. And I will simply move back uh, the structural point with the command move. I will select and insert back. Okay, now let's go back to the loads tab and see the definition of a line load from the element loads. If I click on the line load definition, I need to select one structural line and then hit enter and a very similar dialog box will appear. The first few fields are the same, but here we can have a load geometry that can be changed. But I will show you after first defining our first uniformly distributed load along the structural line. So I will uh, accept all the default settings, except that I would like to apply the load in the global xx direction with a value of 10 kN meter and I will click OK. And now the loading in the global x direction has been assigned to the structural line that I had selected. Now I would like to show that if you double click on the load, you are also directed back to the editing mode.
and now maybe I can show you the distribution of the line loads along a structural line. By default, you are using a uniformly distributed load over the structural line. But it could be non-uniform, or it could be according to a curve. Let me show you the possibilities if I make this window a little bit bigger. For example, if you want to use a curved distribution, then you can select from the linear at the start, linear and in the middle, linear at the end. For example, the linear in the middle could be interesting. If I click on the apply button, you can see then the 10 kN per meter will be in the middle of the structural line. Then it linearly goes back to value 0. But also I can select a nonlinear, for example, a quadratic at the start or quadratic in the middle, for example, and apply this. As you can see, I have a lot of possibilities, for example, cubic at the start and cubic at the end. If you select the known uniform distribution, then you have the possibility to define a value at the beginning point of the structural point, a structural line and uh, a value for the end point of the structural line. If I click on the apply, you will see that it is 10 kN meter at the beginning of the structural line and 20 kN meter at the end of the structural line. Okay, now we can set it back to uniform and click on the apply button. What I would like to show and explain is this eccentricity relative to a point within the section. Basically, you have the possibility to assign the loading referenced to the structural line or referenced to the cross section, we can also say that. For example, if I set the offset direction to be negative local z direction and I enter a value for the offset of 0 0.2 meter, then it will mean that the loading will be applied with a 0 0.2 meter offset in the negative local z direction and it not will be applied in the uh, origin point of the local coordinate system. If you have defined geometry or stress points in the cross section, then you can reference your loading based upon these. The other interesting option is to use the load geometry settings. You can see a small sketch of the structural line here and the legend for this value A, B and C. And the given numbers are as per ratio of the element length. So the current setting means that the full length of the structural line will be loaded. But for example, if I set this to 0 0.5 meter, then the offset C will be automatically jump uh, to 0 0.5 as well. And if I click on apply, now you will see that only half of the structural line will be loaded. You can also work as follows. For example, you want to load only half of the structural line, so you will lock this value. Then you have the possibility to change the offset at the beginning and at the end of the beam. If you set the A offset to be equal with 0 0.25, then automatically the C offset is going to change to 0 0.25 as well. If now you click on the apply, here we are going to find the 0 0.25 offset at the beginning and at the end and the 0 0.5 meter length of loading. Of course, all this input can be given according to the real length of the structural line and not just as per ratio of the element length. Now I will click on the apply and on the OK to demonstrate the possibilities of the free loads. So as I mentioned, the free loads are independent from the structural elements, so we can create them independently. If I click on the line load, for example, the dialog box will look like very similar to the element loads. There are only few additional lines in this dialog box, the reference, 
the number, the direction of the projection, and the range of application. Now I would uh, keep all the default settings except the type. Instead of the load in the gravity direction, I'm going to choose a load in the global y direction being equal with 10 kilonewton meter. And as you can see here, I must go into the graphical user interface and click to start the creation of the loading. So I will simply click on the beginning of the structural line and at the end of my structural line and the load has been generated. I will click escape to terminate the command. Now what I would like to demonstrate is that if I for example move the structural line then the loading will be not moved together with it. So I will simply define a movement vector, I will move away my structural line and the element load has been moved together with my structural element but the free area load is stayed or remained in position. Also if I select my free load then you can see that it has a beginning point and an end point like a geometrical entity and if I for example stretch or move the endpoint of this loading then the length of the loading will be freely changed. Okay now let's get quickly do everything back so I'm going to move back my structural line Okay, so now let's do everything very quickly back. I'm going to select the move and then I will select the structural line and I will move it back to the structural point and I will some, simply delete some of the loads, for example the element load. I will select it and click on the delete button on my keyboard and I will also double click on the structural point and delete the uh, structural point load that I have created with this button here and I will click on apply and OK. So the only uh, remaining load in my system is the free <coughs> line load. Now to further elaborate the possibilities I will double click on this free line load and I will change the type from the global Y to the local Y direction and click apply and OK. Now we cannot see any direction for the line load. We can only assume that the software knows what it does, namely that it is a 10 kN per meter uniform distributed load and only the small Y refers to the direction of the line load. Why is it so? It is because at the current moment the software doesn't know which is the local direction that the load needs to be referenced to. When we export the model, the load will find the structural line which has a local direction and then it will be cleared which direction is the local Y to apply the loads into. Okay, let's do so and quickly export the model by clicking on this export button in the top line. And if we click on this export button, then a question will be asked. If we want to delete all the unused load cases, please select No and click on the OK button to perform the export. As it could be expected, a warning message was triggered during the load generation. Because the software was not able to detect the automatic referencing, of the free line load. However, if we open the graphics, we can have a look at the loads. It was opened on my other screen. If I now go to the loads chapter and go to the input loads and select the all loads and make the visualization of the load a little bit bigger, here at the input loads you can see the 10 kN per meter free line load. And now if we go to the used loads and all loads, now we can see the real uh, load vectors along the structural line. 
or more precisely here now we can see the 10 kN per meter beam loading along the beam elements and if we activate a new layer and on this new layer I'm going to present the local coordinate system of the beam elements then you will see that the local direction of the beam elements really coincide with the uh, loading application direction. So in other words really the load was applied in the local y direction of the beam elements. To demonstrate what is the difference between the input loads and the used loads I will do the following. Please do not do it together with me I am just doing it for representation purposes and to understand better what is the difference between the input loads and the used loads. So if I go back to Sophie Plus and I will select the free line load and I will simply lengthen this loading then you can see that the load is much longer than the structural line itself so a portion of the loading is not going to be applied onto the structural line or later on on the beam elements. So now if I redo the export of my system then we are going to see a clear difference between the input loads and the used loads. We also received a new warning message here that please be careful because the loads activated with less than 100%. The printout will show uh, the real loads involved. And this warning is reasonable because the 100% loading is the full length of the loading, but a portion of it is fall in the air, is not going to be applied on the structural line, hence not 100% of the loading will be applied. So now if I go back to the graphics or the new name WinGraph, then you can see if I selecting the all loads, the input loads and all loads, you will be able to see the 10 kN meter uniformly distributed lo load longer than the beam elements. And now if I show you the used loads, all loads, you can see that the software will understand that only a certain portion of the total loading needs to be applied on the beam elements. Now let me go back to Sophie Plus and try to eliminate all the warnings of the load generation. So to get rid of the warning messages I'm just going to shorten back the loading and I'm also going to edit the load by double clicking on it and instead of the automatic reference I'm going to say or instruct the software I want this load to be referenced on the structural lines number and I'm also going to edit the load by double clicking on it and here for the reference of the free line load I will choose that this load to be referenced on the structural line number 9 I believe because this was the lastly created structural line and then I will simply click apply and OK. If now we export the model hopefully there will be no warning message after the export of the loads and really this is the case I only get back the original warning regarding the stress points not lies within the cross section but the other warnings regarding the loads now have been disappeared. So to define a, a reference for the free loads are very important to help the software on which structural element should the load be applied. For example as now we have a clear reference for the free line load we can even move this free line load in the three-dimensional space the stuff software will still knows on which structural element should the load be referenced to. Let me demonstrate it so I will choose the move command and I will select 
load and I will hit enter and now I can move my loading so I will select one point and for example I will move the load in this direction two meter so the load is far away from the structural line if I now double click on the load to edit it we can see that it is clearly referenced to structural line number nine now we just only need to give enough projection for the load to find the structural element and we just need to set the range of application to be equal or greater than two meter because this range of application means that the load will be applied in the local y direction of the structural line number nine in two meter from the original position or from the drone position of the load which is here so in the local y direction of the structural line the load will be applied in the range of two meter so finally the load will find the structural line and it will be applied on the structural line we can make the definition of the free line load even more extreme let me show you that. For example, now I will change the type of the loading to PXX, so the load will be acting in the global X direction. The reference will be the structural line number 9, but the projection will be in the global Y direction, so projected in the ZX plane. So it means in the YY global direction and the range of application will remain 2 meter. If we now click on the apply and OK, the load direction will be changed on, this, on the screen as well. Uh, let us export the system again and see the results in WinCraft. Now you can see at the input loads and all loads that the load was applied with 10 kilonewton meter value two meter away from the structural line. And if I choose the used loads and all loads, then you will see that the software really applied the 10 kilonewton per meter UDL load on the structural line or finally along the beam elements. So now in this load chapter we have two sub chapter the used loads and the input loads. And now I would like to show you a third possible chapter within these loads and it's going to be the calculation loads. In order to get those we need to perform an analysis of our structure so we need to go back to the SSD of our model. So if you go back to SSD then we can perform a linear analysis by double clicking on the linear analysis uh, task and here by default the all uh, load case on the first tab is selected however if you select the manually uh, selection and then with the right mouse button here you deactivate all the load cases and only select uh, self-fade for the calculation and then click OK the linear analysis will be performed. And now if you go back to WinGraph, then you will be able to find a calculation loads chapter as well within the loads chapter. And if you go to the total load, then you will be able to see the real calculation load on every single node of your system. Now we are presenting the calculation loads of load case number one as can be seen here at the bottom. And to find our very specially applied load we need to open up the calculation loads and here the total load force in global x direction and we will find really the 10 kN per meter UDL load applied on the finite element nodes along the beam sequence. I have prepared a small sketch to demonstrate a use case for this type of loading. Try to imagine, for example, that we have a structure, a tunnel-like structure, 
and we would like to apply a water pressure type of loading or earth pressure type of loading onto the structure. Then we just simply need to create a new free line load next to the structure, set up a non-uniform load where the P1 value is set to zero and the P2 value is set to a certain value in kilonewton per meter run. The direction of the load projection will be from the right to the left. And what we also need to pay attention to is to set the range of application of the load to be equal with the distance measured from the application of the load to the center point of the tunnel, for example. Okay, basically that concludes what I wanted to mention about the definition of the actions and the loads. Now we just need to set back our model to its original position. So I will simply delete this uh, load that we created. I will select and click on the delete button. I will zoom extents and I will save the project with the Control s keyboard combination. Okay, so I think uh, I have explained what I wanted to explain regarding the element loads and the uh, free loads, how to define them, what type of loads do we have in Sophistic, and now what we need to do is to fill the already created load cases with real static loads. As a reminder, I would like to go back to this slide and show you uh, what type of loading we would like to uh, enter. First, we are going to define an additional dead load to the structure with a value of 2.5 kN per square meter. The pre-stressing loads will be activated automatically when we are performing the construction stages with the help of module CSM, so we do not need to define them explicitly here. However, we need to define our wind loads uh, on our superstructure, the possible settlements at the supports, and then we need to set up uh, the temperature changes, the constant temperature change, and the linear temperature change in the single load cases to be able to combine them together into load case 91 to 98. Please notice that most of these loads can be created as an element load, precisely an element load over the structural lines, because the value doesn't changing but constant all over the structural lines. For example, if we consider to define an additional dead load on the superstructure, what we need to do is to create have uh, an element load on the structural lines with a value of 2.5 kN per square meter. Similarly, the wind loads will be applied on all beam elements and along the full length of the structural lines with 3 kN per meter. And also the constant or the linearly changing temperature loads will be applied along the whole length of the structural lines and therefore we can use the structural element type of loading. Now let's go back to SophiePlus to create these loads. In SophiePlus I will show you two ways to create uh, these element loads as follows. Let's start with the usual way. I will go to the front view to see my uh, superstructure from the side and I will select uh, the line load and by fencing the superstructure and hitting enter I will be in the structural line load dialog box. Here as re you remember we can add the title for example asphalt layers then I will choose the load case that I would like to define my loads in then I need to select the classification for the load. This is really going to be a load in this case. Then we need to choose the direction, which is going to be load in the gravity direction in this case. I will apply the load on the 
full length of the structure that line so I do not need to enter or change anything at the load geometry chapter then I will enter the value of this uh, asphalt layers and according to the PowerPoint um, I need to apply 2.5 kN per square meter but the width of my superstructure is 6.3 meter if I multiply these two values to so 6.3 multiplied with 2.5 it's going to be 15.75 kN per meter UDL load a uniform UDL load along all the structural lines so now I just need to click on the OK button and the load will be applied along my superstructure okay this was the regular way how you can define an element load along all the structural lines but now I would like to show you an alternative way because I found it much faster if you need to enter multiple loads to the same structural lines I'm also suggesting you to use this method when you have multiple load cases and you want to apply the loads on the same structural lines many times so what you need to do is go to the structural elements tab and here go and search for the modify the properties of one or more structural lines then the definition dialog box of the structural line will be appeared on the screen please notice that there is a new tab on this structural line dialog box which shows the defined loads on the structural line if I make this window a little bit bigger we can find all the entries of this load we will find the already applied load on the structural lines in load case number two with a classification being equal with load in the gravity direction uh, whose distribution is uniform with a value of 15.75 kN per meter. So what we can do in this dialog box is to create uh, new loads to these structural lines. You just need to click on this plus button on the top right corner and a new line will be given. The next load I would like to add to these structural lines is the wind loading so I will go to the load case column and choose load case number 31 if you may remember this load case was assigned to action ZW which was created to calculate uh, the wind effects on the strong structure including the traffic therefore I, I will add the title wind plus traffic by using the tab button on your keyboard you can go through the columns of an entry line or you just simply double click uh, one field that you would like to adjust for example I would like to set the direction of this load to point in the local Y direction so the type of the loading will be PY load in local Y direction it is going to be a uniformly distributed load with a value of 3 kN meter and if now I click or push the tab button then a new dialog box will appear on my other screen where you can also set the length or the load geometry along the structural line I will just simply click OK to accept that the load will be applied along the whole length of the structural line. Okay, so now we have created a new load on the structural lines. I will go again and click on this plus sign in the top right corner to create my new loads. In this case, I'm going to enter a new load, which is going to be the wind in the construction stages and it's going to be applied in load case 32 the classification of this load is load again the direction is going to be local y again 
and the value will be 3 kilonewton per meter and now I, if I click outside then the value will be accepted without the additional dialog box appearing. Okay so now again I'm going to create or add a new line for the definition of loads. This time I'm not going to give any special name to this. I'm just going to simply select the load case 81 for the constant temperature change plus delta T. This time it's very important to change the classification from load to temperature. And if you drop down the type list, then you will see that there are three possibilities we have. We can select the temperature difference, it's called DT. We can select the temperature difference in local Y direction. And we can select the DTZ, temperature difference in local Z direction. So basically the first one is a constant temperature change on the whole cross section. The delta T Y is a temperature difference in the horizontal plane, whereas the temperature difference in local Z is a temperature difference, a linear temperature change in the vertical plane of the cross section. First, I'm going to define the constant temperature change and therefore I'm selecting the first one. The distribution will be uniform along one structural line and the value will be plus 20 Celsius degree. In a very similar fashion, I'm going to click on the top right corner plus sign to add a new entry line and then I will select the load case to be 82, temperature negative delta T, the classification should be temperature, the type should be DT, and the value is going to be minus 20 Celsius degree. Now I will continue with the definition of the linearly changing temperature loads and I will enter a new line, select load case 83, which is temperature plus delta T Z. I will select the classification to be temperature instead of the DT now I will select the delta T Z, D T Z, because it's going to be a linear temperature change in the vertical plane of the cross section. Okay, and the value of this temperature change will be plus 8 Celsius degree. Now I will add my very last line in this definition and I will select a load case uh, 84, temperature negative, delta T, Z. The classification should be temperature, again. The type of the load should be D, T, Z. And the value should be equal with negative 12.3 degree of Celsius. The values for the linearly changing temperature loads being equal with 8 and minus 12.30 was based upon the code. However, here of course it could be any value given. Uh, the reason why I entered this because once uh, we calculated the, these values and found these are the reasonable one for the plus temperature change and for the negative temperature change for this type of structure. Okay, so now we are done with the definition of the loads that could be applied on the structural lines. So I will simply click OK. And now all of these load cases are presented on my structure, not just the asphalt layers loads. However, there is a type of loading that we were not able to apply on the structural lines. And this type of loading is the settlement loading because the settlement loads needs to be applied on the structural points. So let's zoom to the extents of my structure and try to apply this load on the structural points. The methodology will be the same, namely to go to the structural elements tab 
and select the modifies the properties of one or more structural points. I will click on it and select the structural points at my first support plane and then hit the enter button on my keyboard and then I will be directed to the dialog box of the definition of the structural points. Here you can see that I have really selected many points, not just one. And here we will find the loads tab where we can create the loads. I will click on the, on the plus sign in the top right corner to add a new entry line. And from the load case, I will select a load case 51 settlement of the abutment at the beginning. The classification should be a displacement and the type should be a displacement in the global Z direction. And now we should have a look at the orientation of the global Z axis because it is pointing upwards. So if I want a settlement at this abutment, I need to enter negative 10 millimeter and then click on the OK button. As you can see, the load applied on the structural points you can see here VZZ minus 10 millimeter. Okay, now I will click Escape to unselect the structural points. And let's do the same definition for the middle support at the pier. I will repeat the procedure and click on the modification of the structural point. Hit Enter, uh, add a new entry line, select load case 52 classification should be displacement in the global Z direction with a value of minus 10 millimeter and I will click OK. Let's continue the definition of the settlement loads on the third abutment. The procedure is the same. I click on the modification of the structural point. Select the two structural points at the end. Hit enter and then you can add a new line like so. Then I will select a load case 53. Classification is a displacement. The type displacement in global Z direction with a value of minus 10 millimeter. And then I will click OK. OK, so now it seems that we have defined all the additional loads on my structure. So we are done with the definition of the static loads. At this stage of the model creation, it is useful to export the model and run the single load cases to see how the structure behaves or how the structure responds to these loads. The load case number 11 is not used. Do I want to delete it? No. So I will just simply export the model with the OK button. And then I will go back now to SSD. And here in SSD, I will simply choose the linear analysis and double click on it. And in the linear analysis dialog box, we can have the opportunity to calculate all the load cases or manually select some of the load cases that we would like to calculate. Now I will choose the manually and I will take out load case 11 because it is an unused load case and then I will simply click on the OK button. The analysis is performed, the module AZ, module ASE was running and wind graph, module wing was also executed. Now we can have a look at the results. If we click on here in the bottom left corner to the system visualization, then first the system is displayed, presented for us. But we also have the possibility to click through the load cases and see the deformation diagram. Here you can have a better view if you stop the animation with this freeze image button in the top left corner. And then you have the option to click through these load cases and see, for example, the wind from the right is acting as we expected. Also, it's a very useful way to look at the results if we go and 
uh, check the checkbox amplitude and set a uniform uh, amplitude for every load case, for example 500, and then you have a feeling about the magnitude of the displacement through the load cases. So for example, with a magnitude of 500, this is a deformation diagram from the sulfate, with the same magnitude, this is the deformation from the additional dead load. You can use also your arrow keys on your keyboard to go through the uh, load cases, for example, the settlement at the beginning of our structure, in the, at the middle, at the end, the temperature change, the temperature change in the negative uh, direction, then the positive delta Tz and the negative delta Tz. So for me, the result seems to be reasonable, so we can continue our modeling. However, this check or verification should be done after the first few single load cases has been created, because if there is a problem with the structure, it is, it is an easy way now to see what the problem is, and we can revise it or amend it very easily. Okay, so now we can conclude basically our chapter regarding the action and the load definition. And now I would like to show you the filtering option in the next chapter. So in the coming chapter I would like to talk about the filtering options in Sophie Plus. So let's switch back to Sophie Plus and go to the filter tab. As you can see on the screen, there are two major types of the filters. The first one is the built-in filters, and one can create the so-called user-defined filters as well. With the help of the built-in filters, we can create filters with which we can filter out the structures by types and its groups. You can activate a filter if you check in the checkbox next to its name. So, for example, if I want to activate the structure filter, then I just simply need to check this box in. And as you can see, now I am presenting all of the structure elements only in my model. So, the loads are not visible anymore. By default, the sub-chapters, which can filter out the elements by type or by group, is turned on. You can drop down the list and select or deselect the structural elements you would like to represent. For example, with the right mouse button in this area, you can say uncheck all items. And now, for example, I would like to see the point constraint only. I check it in and right away on my screen, I will only be able to see the point constraints. Or let's suppose that I would like to only represent the structural lines in my structure. I can do that by simply selecting the line entry only. You can achieve a very similar result if you click on this dot 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 button and then a list selection will appear on the other screen. If I drag it to this one, then also in this list you can simply multi-select with your shift or control button and then you can click on the OK to accept the settings and the filters will be undertaken. For example, for better visualization, I normally turn off the representation of the placement, so I will just, I will just simply drop down the list and I will unselect the placements and then uh, click. And now you can have a much clearer visualization of the structure. Now I would like to demonstrate the filter of the loads. By default, if I check the checkbox in, then you will see all the loads. And you can filter according to the type of the loading. For example, if I want to look at only the line loads, then I will uncheck all the items and select the line loads and click on the Sophie Plus toolbar. Now, if we zoom closer, we can see that only the line loads are represented. The point loads, for example, the settlement loads are not shown in my screen. If you want to further filter the loads, then, for example, you can show the load case by its number. 
For example, I will deselect all the load cases and I will only select load case number two, which is the additional dead load. And right now we can see load case two with the value of 15.75 kN per meter in the screen. With the help of this small arrows, we can go back and forth between the load cases. And this is also a very handy tool to just simply select the load case that we want to represent. I forgot to mention that, of course, the structure can be also filtered according to groups. If you drop down the list, you can, for example, have the opportunity to only uh, present uh, group 20, which is our superstructure and uh, the couplings. And now let's try to create a user-defined filter. First, I will deselect the built-in filters and zoom extends to see the whole structure. Then I will click on the Add New Filter button. Maybe the best way to show you how the user-defined filters are working is to uh, recreate the structure filter, for example. We can do that by simply adding a name, for example, System, and you select it. By default, now nothing is showing on the screen, which is correct, because at the moment I haven't assigned anything to this system filter. Now let's see what options we have to create uh, such a filter or any kind of user-defined filter. We have Sophipus uh, built-in variables like element type, load case, load type, primary, group and text. And of course plenty more, but these are the major ones that uh, we could use. And this is something that I would like to show you now as well. So please choose the element type first in this list. And what we can see here, after the selection of the type, we have a boolean operator, for example, equal, not equal, greater than, smaller than, and so on. If we have chosen the element type, now we only have the boolean operator equal or not equal. Please choose the equals. And then from the drop down list, we can select the element types that we would like to represent. For example, I only want to represent the line, the area elements, and the point constraint. And I will click outside. And right away, as you can see, my user defined filter is working. If I turn it on and off, this is the full structure without any filter applied. And this is the structure with the user defined filter applied, which is called system. There is one more very interesting and useful user defined filter that I would like to show. Please click on the add new filter button and create a new filter together with me. Then please deselect the system user defined filter and check in the newly created filter and add a name like left half. So I will simply enter left half and then from the first drop down list instead of the element type I will choose the tags option. In an AutoCAD environment, we can define or assign text to any kind of AutoCAD element by editing its properties. Let me show you this to you. Please deselect now the left half user defined filter and go back to the filter structure by type and group built in filter and select it. Let us quickly set back everything to its default value, so I will also represent the groups 10 and 20, and I will also uh, present the placement and every structural entity as well. Now I will go to the front view and make a selection about the left half of my structure. If now I click with my right mouse button, I have the possibility to choose the properties from the drop-down list. And the properties dialog box should appear on your screen. It could be the case that it's appearing at a different spot in your screen. 
In this dialog box, you will see the general chapter. Please click on the small arrow here. Then the chapter will be closed and then please reopen it. To have these GUI ID and the name and the tags. If you click on the tags, then you will see a further icon on the right side. Please click on it. Then the Sophistic Text dialog box will appear. And here we can enter a new tag name, for example, left half of the structure. Then you simply need to click on the Add button and then on the OK button. If you do so, then this tag name, left half of the structure, will appear in the property box and the selected items will be assigned to this tag name. OK, now you can simply close the properties box and then click on the Escape to terminate the command. And now please deselect the built-in filters such as the structure built-in filter and also accidentally the filter loads by type and load cases was selected by me. Also deselect it. Now we can see the structure without any filters applied at all. And now if we uh, activate the left half of the structure, you can see that the left half of the structure tag was selected automatically because we had only defined one tag. And what was assigned to this tag is appearing on the screen at the moment. So this is a very useful way to create your user-defined filter. Just create new tags and then you can apply new filters based upon these tags. Let me tell you a practical example. For example, if you select your columns in your building that was defined as a cross-section IPE300, for example, then you can uh, assign a tag for these columns like IPE300 and you can easily filter according to this tag and it's very easy to change the cross-section for example an already defined uh, selection hence it is very easy to change your columns from the section IPE300 to IPE500 for example one disadvantage of this method is that now if I add new elements to the model, it's not going to be automatically assigned to this tag name. So you need to be sure that you are applying these built-in filters when the whole structure is done, or you need to pay attention to that a newly created element will not be automatically assigned to the text name. Okay, so basically that concludes the explanation of the filters. Either they are built-in filters or user-defined filters. Now you will be able to represent your structure in a much clearer way. Now to clean up the filters, you can also have the possibility to remove the filters by clicking on this remove filter button and then you are back at the original state of your model. I will just simply click on the zoom extents and save the model with the Ctrl S keyboard combination.